Welcome back. Hope you had a good break. And uh, we are now going to take off with our next session right now with holographic MIMO communications. Now, today, massive MIMO is a mature technology. Its advantages in terms of spectral efficiency, energy efficiency, and power control are well understood and recognized. Now, this talk considers arbitrary, spatially stationary scattering and provides a representation that captures the essence of electromagnetic propagation and allows to evaluate the capacity of holographic MIMO systems. And to tell us more about this is a speaker who received the 2018 Marconi Prize Paper Award in Wireless Communications. His expertise and general interest span the areas of communications and signal processing. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome all the way from Italy's University of Pizza, Associate Professor Luca Sanguinetti. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and present my latest work in the context of MIMO communications. So let me share my screen. Okay, let me go full screen. Okay. Can you see my slides? Okay, I think we, we, we are good. Okay, the topic here is, uh, is, uh, is MIMA communications and uh, more than that is what I call holographic MIMO communications. I'll try to clarify the, the concept be, beyond uh, the, 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 the keyword holographic during the talk. Okay, for those of you that are not familiar with MIMO communications, let me quickly introduce you the concept. I mean, MIMO communications stand for a system with multiple transmit antennas and multiple receive antennas. And the, the coupling between the multiple transmit antennas and the multiple receive antennas is uh, taken into account by complex coefficients, which I call here H and M. They represent the channel gain between the source antenna N and the receive antenna M. Now, MIMO, MIMO communications have been around for a long time. So we have investigated so many possible MIMO configurations during the last 20 years. You can, if you search in the literature, you can see MISE communications where you have multiple transmit antennas and a single receive antenna. Simo communications where you have a single transmit antenna and a multiple multiple receive antennas, or you have you may have multi-user MIMO, which which stands for multiple user equipped with multiple transmit antennas and multiple receive antennas. Now the latest implementation of a MIMO technology is massive MIMO. Massive MIMO is a, is one of the key technologies for. 5G networks. And we are now looking for what is next. For example, cell-free massive MIMO is considered as, a, as the evolution of massive MIMO. And it's basically a massive MIMO technology where there are no more cells. All the access points, base stations will serve jointly the users which are active in a given coverage area. Even cell-free massive MIMO has been around for a while, and there is a lot of uh, research going on in this, on this topic. What I want to do today is to introduce you a different concept, which is what I call holographic MIMO communications. Now, to get even more familiar with the MIMO, with the MIMO model, so no matter how many, no matter what you have 
in between the transmit antennas and the multiple receive antennas, you can come up with a very simple discrete representation of a MIMO communication system, which is the following, the following, which is this one basically, where Y is the receive vector, H is the channel matrix collecting all the channel gains, X is the transmitted symbol, and then you have the thermal noise. Now, if you want to assess the realistic performance of any MIMO technology, the key is to have a proper model for the channel matrix H. If you don't have a proper model, you may not be able to assess the ultimate performance of the MIMO technology that you have in mind. So modeling the channel is one of the major research problem in any MIMO communication system. So there are many different MIMO channel models in the wireless literature. They can be basically classified in two categories. One category is given by deterministic channels. The other one is given by stochastic channels. The deterministic channel models, they are very common in electromagnetic theory and they have good advantages because they are very accurate for any given specific scenario. The way they are built is by using ray tracing approaches, recording channel measurements. So in, in this way, by using these approaches, you can come up with a deterministic channel model, which is very accurate for the specific scenario. The disadvantage is that you cannot use this model to, to measure the performance of the system, to assess the performance of the system in a different scenario. That's why in communication theory, we like to have stochastic models. They are based on different approaches. They do not depend on a specific scenario. And this is the advantage of stochastic channel models. The disadvantage is that there are several disadvantages, but the, the, the most critical one is that they are, it's not very easy to build a stochastic channel model, which is able to capture the essence of electromagnetic propagations. Let me give you an example. There is a very common channel model in MIMO communications, which is valid whenever you have line of sight propagation conditions, which means that you have a source, a receiver, nothing in between, and there is a line of sight connection between the, between the source and the receiver. So in this case, the MIMO channel matrix takes this form, where beta is the pathless, and then these two vectors are basically the array response vectors, the receiver and uh, the transmitter. So the model is very simple and is composed, each array response vector is composed by plane waves in a very simple, it can be computed in a very simple way on the basis of plane waves. So if you use this model to evaluate the capacity of, of the MIMO system, the capacity takes these four, where these are the number of antennas at the receiver, the number of antennas at the source, beta is the pathless, P is the power, and sigma square is the variance of the noise. As you can see in this case, the channel matrix uh, is a rank one matrix because it's given by the two, two vectors. So you, we can achieve the full array gain of the system, which is given by the product of the number of transmit antennas and number of receive antennas, but we only have one, one degree or degrees of freedom in the system, which means that we can only transmit one stream, one data stream. And the reason is why, and the, the reason is because the channel matrix has rank one. 
And this doesn't depend on the number of antennas that you employ, the transmitter and receiver. No matter how many antennas you have, you can still transmit one single data stream. But is this right? It is under the conditions for which the model, the channel model is valid. Indeed, if you change the condition and if you consider a more realistic setup, you can prove that by using very simple, very simple, I mean, tools in, in electromagnetic theory, you can prove that whenever you have two surfaces that are communicating in a line of sight propagation scenario, the degrees of freedom of the system is given by the area of the receiver, the area multiply the area of the source divided by the wavelength square and the square distance between the transmitter and the receiver. So for example, if you have a transmitter with, with, a, with, with these dimensions and a receiver with these dimensions, so you have a two by two square planar surface and the distance between the source and the destination is 10 meters, then the, the DOF, the degrees of freedom, the, num, the, the number of multiple data streams that you can transmit from the source to the receiver is not one but is 16 if you operate the system, uh, the carry frequency of 30 gigahertz is 1,600 if you operate the system at the frequency of 300 gigahertz. So by, by, from these results, it's clear that there is much more to gain. In a line of sight scenario, by using classical channel models in wireless communications, we have only one degrees of freedom. Sing we can only transmit single data stream. But if we use more accurate models from electromagnetic theory, we can gain and transmit many more data streams. And when I say many more, it depends on the frequency you are operating the system. So why we are not able to exploit the the DOF of the system when we use, for example, the classical line of sight MIMO channel model. The point is that the classical MIMO channel model is not taking into account that when you increase the size of the receiver and you decrease the wavelength by operating the system at higher frequencies, we do not operate in the far field front of a region of electromagnetic propagations, but we operate in the Fresnel near field region of electromagnetic propagation. This is the condition to operate, to operate in, in, in one region or in the other region. So for example, if you have a, if you have a surface, which is one by one meter, so if you operate the system, the frequency of three gigahertz, the distance above which you have, you operate in the far field region and the classical MIMO channel models are valid is 20 meters. So if you are 20 meters away from the source, then you can use the classical MIMO channel models which rely on the far field approximation. But if you increase the frequency of your system, then the distance grows. For example, if you operate the system at 28 gigahertz, the, 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 the Fraunhofer and Fresnel region, they are the happen at the distance, which is approximately 200 meters. And even more if you go up in frequency. So this near field, can, can occur at any frequency, depending on the distance. But even if you consider, for example, the, the sub six gigahertz frequencies, you see here that we can, we can really enter in this 
near field region, and there is a lot more that we can exploit to improve the performance of the MIME communication system. And this is precisely the objective of, of what we are doing in my group in these days in the context of MIME communications. Since we are operating at high frequencies and we are operating with large arrays, we had to develop, revise the classical MIMO channel models, which are based on the far field approximation to basically exploit all the potentials that the electromagnetic propagations can provide us. And this is precisely the concept of holographic communications. We want to come up with a system which is able to fully exploit the propagation characteristics offered by electromagnetics. In this way, this is the only way to exploit the ultimate performance of the system. Okay, so the holographic MIMO system, an holographic MIMO system is a system which relies on a channel model, which is which is able to capture the sense of electromagnetic propagations. And then according to this model, you can build a system, a wireless communication system, which is able to exploit all the degrees of freedom of the channel itself. Okay, now we get into the more, let's say, technical part of the talk where I'm going to introduce you the, the latest results that we have in this contest. I'll try to keep it simple. You can take, you can, you can, if you're interested in the details, you can check the, the references that I'm going to list you in the slides. So, but if you, if you think anything is missing, just let me know. Okay, so just to wrap up, the idea here is to have a MIMO communication system with a given number of antennas, the sorts, which are distributed or over a planar surface, and then a given number of receive antennas, which are distributed over a receive planar surface. And the idea is to come up with a channel model for the MIMO channel matrix, which is able to capture the characteristics of electromagnetic propagations without leaving out some particular very important characteristics, which are not taken into account by classical stochastic channel models. To do that, we simplify the system and we consider monochromatic and scalar waves. So we assume that the information is exchanged by using scalar waves and they Oh, the, which are transmitted at a given frequency. And then we assume that the scattering mechanism here is such that the electromagnetic MIMO channel can be assumed to be zero mean and spatially stationary Gaussian random field. So under these assumptions, we are going to develop a channel model which is approximately exact, I will clarify what I mean with approximately exact, but which will, be, which will be simple to manage in the order to come up with a MIMO communication system, which is able to exploit all the, all the, all the um, potential benefits of electromagnetic propagations. So the starting point is the, is this observation. So any physically meaningful stochastic models must be based on plane wave expansions. Why? Because the plane wave expansion is a natural Hagen solution of the Helmholtz equation, which is what is driving electromagnetic propagations. Now, Plane wave model has been used in the wireless literature, but they have been used and developed under the assumption that the source and receiver are very far away. So in this case, you can approximate the wavefront as approximately planar over the entire array. 
This is the far failed approximation that I have talked about before. But since we are operating with very large antenna arrays and we are operating at high frequencies, this assumption is not valid. For example, this assumption here was used in, in, the, in the virtual channel representation pioneered by Said in 2002. However this, however, this model here is valid only in the far field region. So in this work, which we have recently submitted to transactions on information theory, we show that under arbitrary, specially stationary scattering conditions, so you can take any scattering condition between the source and the receiver, the plane wave representation can be used to exactly represent wave propagation no matter what is the distance between the source and the receiver. So the main result of this work is that no matter if you are operating in the far field region or in the near field region where there is a lot to gain, no matter of, of that, the plane wave representation is still, can still be used to exactly represent wave, wave propagation between the source and the receiver. Thanks to this result, we can come up with a quite simple representation of the channel between the source and the receiver, continuous representation of the channel between the source and the receiver, between any point at the receiver and any point at the source, which takes this very simple form where AS here is the source response which is basically the array response towards a particular propagation direction, which is indexed by this vector kappa. Then we have the receive response from a particular propagation direction k. And then we have the angular response in between, which maps every incident direction kappa onto every receive direction k. So these three components are enough to characterize the entire channel between point source and the point the receiver side. And the integration here is not over the entire wave number domain. This is the wave number domain, but it's over a disk which depends on the wave number of the system, which is basically a function of the wavelength of the system. Now the angular response here can be decomposed in two, in two terms. One is the power spectral density and the other one is, is a Gaussian random field with zero mean and variance one. And the power spectral density is what we use to basically describe uh, how the power is distributed in the angular domain. So if you want in the wave number domain between directions kappa and k. And the beauty of this model is that you can decompose, you can decouple the effect of the array geometries and the scattering. Why? Because the array geometry is basically represented by the sorts and receive responses and is a deterministic effect. The stochastic effect is entirely embedded into the angular response which, as I said, is going to tell us how to distribute the, how the power is distributed angularly between the, the, the directions the receiver and directions the source. And this power spectral density, if you, if you start from the first principles of electromagnetics, is a precise structure, which is given by this one. I'm not going to tell you why this is the structure. The important thing is that every, everything here is defined, is, I mean, is um, properly defined, except for this spectral factor here, which is arbitrary and which can be used to model any propagation conditions in the system. So if you have 
seen here, we have a representation which is given in terms of integrals. Integrals are good, but, if, but in communications or in signal processing, sums are better. So instead of using this representation, which is exact, but given in, in, in forms of integral, we can, actually, we can actually look for a different representation, which is given by, which is given terms of sums. And the way to obtain that is, is, is quite simple because it's like passing from a plane wave representation, which is continuous in the spatial domain to a plane wave series, which is discrete in, in, the, in the wave number domain. So as I told you, I mean, I'm not going to tell you the details of these steps, which, because they are simple, but tricky in the same in the same time what is important here is that we can get something which is which is very much accurate but it, instead of being a four is instead of being in terms of inter instead of being given in terms of integrals it is given in terms of sums and when i say the approximate is good the approximation is good as long as the size of the array is bigger compared to the wavelength, which is the operating regime we are targeting in future wireless communication systems. And the important thing here is that the number of discrete plane waves that should be used to represent the channel, which is basically the cardinality of the sets here, is finite. Is finite and given by these two numbers. This is the number of finite discrete plane waves that should be used to represent the source. And this is the number of finite discrete plane waves that should be used to describe the receiver. So as you can see, they are like in the, if you remember, like in the, like in the line of sight conditions, they are, they are a function of the area of the surface divided by the square of the wavelength. This is for the source and this is for the receiver. So we have a finite number of discretized plane waves that can be used to describe, to approximate the channel between any point, any point at the receiver, any point at the source. Now, with this model, with this model, which is kind of simple because it is basically given by the array response, the receiver, the array response, the source, and then in between you have random coefficients which are called coupling coefficients, which are Gaussian distributed with a variance which is given by this expression here. So as I said, mathematically speaking, it is simple, but the way to get and to get to these results is a bit tricky. So let me try to give you some physical um, interpretation of this result. Okay, first of all, as I told you, everything here is, is fixed because this is given by the geometry of the array, of the receiver. This is given by the geometry of the, of the array at the source. In between, you have these coefficients, which are called coupling coefficients. So they, they play the key role here in this representation. Let me try to show you what they represent. They basically represent the coupling between two different angular sets between the source and the receiver. So basically you transmit some power within this angular set, then there is a scattering mechanism, and then you receive some power at the receiver along different angular sets. So the coupling coefficients are basically measuring the how much any source angular set is coupled with any received angular set. And of course, I mean, the strength of these coupling coefficients is not equal, all equal, because it depends on the structure of the array geometries and on the scattering mechanism in between. The important thing here is that 
If you measure these coupling coefficients, you can understand two important parameters, key parameters in, in any MIMO communication system, which are basically the number of parallel channels, which are basically the degrees of freedom of the channel and the level of diversity. To let you understand, so assume that I'm transmitting from these angular sets and I'm receiving power at the receiver by over th these three different angular sets. This means that the level of diversity is three. So I transmit from a single angular set and I'm receiving power from three different angular sets. So the level of diversity is three. At the same time, I'm transmitting from different angular sets and receiving power from different angular sets. No matter what is the level of diversity, the different number of colors that they have in the network is basically giving us the degrees of freedom of the MIMO communication system. Which means it's giving us the number of multiple data streams that they can transmit over the MIMO channel. Just to give you an example, this is what you get in the isotropic propagation conditions. Isotropic propagation conditions means that you're receiving power from everywhere in space. So if you consider, if you consider the receiver only, and you assume that this is the ratio between the sides of the receiver and the wavelength, these are the basically, this is the power that you get over in the angular domain when you have. When, when the size is, when the ratio is 10, and this is what you get when this ratio is 13. The reason why, the, as you can see, I mean, the number of ang angular sets increases as you increase the size of the array is because you are basically increasing the size of the array compared to the wavelength. So you're increasing the resolution, spatial resolution of the array. So in this case, we have 300, more than 300, degrees of freedom, in this case, we have 3,000, more than three, um, approximately 3,000 degrees of freedom in the system that can be exploited. If you consider non-isotropic propagation conditions, the situation is different. You are not receiving power from everywhere in, in, in the angular domain, but you're only receiving power from particular directions like like in this case, but the situation is the same. If you increase the number, if you increase the size of the array, you increase the number of degrees of freedom in the system. For example, in this case, the number of degrees of freedom is 34, while in this case is approximately 229. Okay, but there is a lot to gain, as you can see here. So now we have a model. Let's build the MIMO channel matrix. The first the first point to answer is how to sample the channel in the spatial domain such that the Nyquist sampling condition is satisfied. And you can reasonably prove that if you sample the array with, with, uh, with a uniform sampling, then if the distance is smaller than half wavelength, the Nyquist condition is satisfied. So this means that we need to keep, for example, for the receiver array, we need to keep the receiver array with a with number of antennas, which is bigger than this ratio here, which is, if you remember, bigger than the maximum number of degrees of freedom that is available at the receiver. Now, the point to satisfy the Nyquist condition is, is this. Remember, we want to have an holographic MIMA communication. We want to exploit all the potentials of the electromagnetic channel. This is the reason why we should have a number of antennas with a, which is bigger than this number here. Otherwise, we are go we're going to lose some of the uh, main, some of the degrees of freedom of the system. So we cannot achieve the ultimate performance of the MIMO communication system. So by doing this, by sampling in the spatial domain, the system uh, according to the Nyquist condition, we can come up with a very, with a, with a simple MIMO channel matrix, which has this form here. I mean, don't pay attention to the, to how to get here, but the, pay attention to the structure of this MIMO channel matrix. So these two matrices here 
are deterministic and semi-unitary. And they're basically the DFT matrices if, if you sample the array uniformly in space. Then in between, you have this matrix here, which is random. And this is the angular random matrix, which is built by this diagonal matrix is here, which account for the, for the shift for the distance, basically. And then in between, you have this matrix, which is basically given by the random, random, mm, random Gaussian metric, matrix, and then the variances that we have, basically the strength of the coupling coefficients that we have, that we have uh, introduced before. So once you have the coupling coefficients, and you, you know the, 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 the power of the coupling coefficients, you can build the channel matrix by multiplying with this uh, Gaussian matrix here, take into account the, the propagation, the distance between the source and the receiver, and then applying these DFT matrices. It's very simple. And at the same time, it is very, it's very accurate to model the electromagnetic propagation between the source and the receiver. Since the number of modes that you have in the, in the wave number domain, the angular domain is much lower than the number of transmit antennas and the number of receive antennas, we have a low rank approximation of the channel. So H is a low rank approximation of the channel, of the electromagnetic channel, because we have a very large matrix, but inside we have a small, much smaller matrix, which is basically capture the sense of electromagnetic propagations in the system. Okay, so by looking at this model, since these are semi-unitary matrices, all the information is in the angular random matrix, which is a function of the strength of the coupling coefficients. So if, if you want to measure the number of parallel streams that we can transmit over the MIMO, over the MIMO channel, we only need to measure the rank of the angular random matrix, which is given by basically the number of coupling coefficients that we have in the system. So this is given by exactly by how many, how many colors here, different colors here we are we have in the in the angular domain. Mathematically, this amounts to look for the number of rows and columns in this matrix, which are not identically zero. The beauty of this result is that no matter how many antennas we have the source and the receiver, the number of degrees of freedom is given by the electromagnetic propagation conditions, which as it should be. The ultimate performance do not depend on the array geometry, how many antennas you have, the source and the receiver. They depend on the electromagnetic propagation conditions. And the maximum can be, can be achieved under isotropic scattering conditions, which is what I have shown you, shown you here. So under isotropic propagation conditions, you, you, as you can see, you receive power everywhere in the angular domain. If you have non-isotropic conditions, then you receive power from particular angular directions and the number of degrees of freedom reduces. So the maximum number is given by the, the it can achieve under isotropic scattering and is given by, and is given by, and is given by the, 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 it depends on the area of the source and the wavelength and the area of the receiver and the wavelength. There is an important message here. It doesn't depend on the, on the thickness of the source and the receiver. It doesn't depend if you, for example, instead of using a plane array, use a volume array, then the number of degrees of freedom is not going to change. And this is a known result, known result in physics, because I mean, the, the, what, what, you, what you can gain by increasing the, the, the thickness of the array is fully deterministic. So there is nothing, no extra information that can be captured by using, by using a volume instead of a plane array. So the key consequence is if you have a 3D volumetric array, 
no extra degrees of freedom can be achieved compared to a planar array, to the planar array. There is, an important there, there, is, there is another important message that I want to uh, bring to your attention is that if you compute the statistics of the channel according to the model that we have developed, it doesn't have a Kronecker structure. Why? Because the source and the receiver are not decoupled. With the model, the source and the receiver are coupled together. So, the model does not have a Kronecker structure. And the other message here is that if you go to measure the, I mean, the covariance matrix is going to measure the correlation that you experience in, 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 the, in the channel, in the spatial domain. If you, and a possible way to, med, to quantify the amount of spatial correlation is by measuring, is by plotting the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix. So if you plot the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix by using the plane wave model that we have developed, as you can see here, and you compare, for example, with the, with the Clark isotropic channel model, which is exact, but relies on a different, uh, a different approach. So first of all, they match. I mean, the, as you can see, the eigenvalues are approximately the same. The degrees of freedom are, are given by this point here. So first of all, they match, and this is a way to validate our model. The second observation is that, as you can see, if you compare this, if you compare the, the, the behavior of the eigenvalues with the independent, identically independent really finished channel model, which is quite, quite common in, in the MIMO literature, as you can see, they're quite different. They are quite different, which means that you shall never use this model to model the channel matrix when you use planar arrays. Because no matter, no matter what you have inside, isotropic, non-isotropic propagation conditions, spatial correlation will occur because, because of the electromagnetic propagation principles. If you reduce, if you if you consider an isotropic and isotropic non-isotropic scattering conditions, then the eigenvalues distribution changes uh, a lot, and then the number of significant eigenvalues reduces substantially because of the non-isotropic propagation conditions. But the key point is that if you compare the Rayleigh fading distribution, which assumes to have independent antennas and the source and the receiver with a plane wave model, they're, they're really different because we, you, you have spatial correlation in the system. And the message here is that you should never use when you have planar rays, the Rayleigh fading channel model, because it's not able to account for the spatial correlation that naturally you have because of the electromagnetic propagation conditions. Okay, just to let me tell you a few words about the generation of the, of the channel by using this model. It's very simple. Once you have measured, once you have measured the, the coupling coefficients, the strength of the coupling coefficients, which is given by the matrix sigma here, you just need to generate random matrix to compute the angular, the angular random matrix. Once you have the angular, ran, ran, ang, the angular random matrix, you apply the, propagate, the, the migration filters, the propagation filters, which takes into account, I mean, the position of the source and receiver. And finally, you apply the DFT matrices, or if you want the semi-unitary matrices to get the, to obtain the channel matrix H. The system is very simple. I mean, the way to generate the, system, the, the channel matrix is very simple. And there is an alternative way which can be used, which basically relies on, on, on using the statistics of the channel and which is given by this one. So you compute the statistics of the channel, you compute the again, again the composition of the channel, and then you can generate the channel matrix according to the unitary matrix that you get from the again the composition of the correlation matrix. Now, because of the equivalence between the angular random matrix and the H 
tilde matrix here, I mean, the propagation, the, the migration filters did, did not change the statistics of the channel, you can use this alternative approach. Let me tell you just, uh, just uh, a few, few more things. I mean, I can skip this one. So if you want to evaluate the capacity of the holographic MIMO communication system based on this channel model, you can exploit the semi-unitary equivalence between the spatial domain and angular domain. So you move in the angular domain, and then you can, you can compute the capacity of the system that since according to this new channel model, I mean, new input output relation, which is now in the angular domain. To, to clarify, this is what you what we had. According to the spatial domain characterization of the MIMO channel matrix, you can move into the angular domain by using the DFT pre-processing and post-processing matrices, and then you move in the angular domain. The beauty of, of operating in the angular domain is that you simplify the signal processing algorithms because they are not a function of the number of antennas that you have at the source and receiver, which can be huge, but it's a function of the effective degrees of freedom of the electromagnetic channel, which, which are much less than the large number of antennas that you can have the receiver and the source. Okay, going back to the model. So once you have this model, you can simply compute the ergodic capacity of the system. And then by using information theory tools, you can compute the capacity under the assumption of perfect knowledge of the receiver, perfect knowledge of the source and the receiver, statistical knowledge of the, of the channel of the source, and so, and so, and so forth. You can use all the classical results, apply the classical results in the angular domain, and compute the capacity of this equivalent, equivalent uh, MIMO channel model. Just to give you some numerical results, if you use the model for evaluating the capacity of the system as a function of the SNR, this is what you get. So by using the plane wave model, so under isotropic propagation conditions, you, we see a perfect match with the Clark model, which is exact but derived under different, different by using different tools. If you have non-isotropic propagation conditions, the capacity reduces because of the spatial correlation that you have in the system. And once again, if you use the correlated infinite model, you get very huge, very much better performance. But as I said, this model is not electromagnetic, is not, is not physically meaningful because any electromagnetic channel model should exhibit, exhibit correlation in the spatial domain when you have a 2D planar array. So let me go to the conclusions of this talk. So the main motivation of this, of this talk and, and, and the work we're doing in, in my group together with, 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 with different colleagues is that we are operating high frequencies and we are operating with very large antenna rays. So we should change the classical models that we have in the MIMO literature in the order to exploit the fundamental limits of the technology. The model that they have introduced you is valid under arbitrary scattering conditions in the large, sorry, in the near field and far field regime, and is very useful to conduct research whenever you have large and dense antenna rays, large compared to the wavelengths of the uh, system. So this is not the end of the story, basically, because the, mo the model can be, can be improved by introducing the mutual coupling effect, by introducing polarized antenna rays. But the, the hope that we have here is that we want to excite the interest in wireless communications toward physics is part channel models. And this is the, what, the only way, if you want, if you want, the only way to push the limits of the MIMO technology. What, it, what is missing is real world measurements to support the theory and to correctly extract the model parameters because everything is based on the coupling coefficients in the angular domain. 
what we need. We need real measurements to support the theory and to extract the model parameters. This is the op. I think this is the way to go if we want to, to, in, to get the most out of the MIMO technology. We need to go back to the physics, I mean, physic, physics principles of electromagnetic propagations. This requires a lot of thinking for people like me in wireless communications. But the beauty, I mean, the good news is that we are 10, 10 years ahead from 6G, so we still have a lot of time to think and work in the order to get the most out of the next MIMO communication technologies. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Associate Professor Luca Sanguinetti. And of course, we'll now move on to the question and answer segment. We've got some questions for you, uh, Associate Prof. Now, our first question for you is, the proposed channel model has been used in your work to compute the spectral efficiency of MIMO systems. What other possible applications in which the framework can provide new insights? What is your uh, answer on that one? Yeah, I mean, the model, the point of the model, the model is very accurate. It's based on electromagnetic principles. It can be used to understand the, the fundamental limit of, of MIMA communications. For example, it can be computed for, for, for analytically computing the degrees of freedom of the electromagnetic channel, to, which, can, which means it can be used to design the system in advance based on the electromagnetic propagation conditions that we have in, 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 in the system. Indeed, we are doing some, some work to, uh, to come up with new communication schemes that operate in the wave number domain, which means in the angular domain, and exploit the electromagnetic characteristics of the channel. That this is the main, the main point of our model. We can design the system according to what will be out there, not based on models which may not realis realistically um, represent the electromagnetic propagation conditions of the system. Fantastic. And we have another question for you. Let's uh, bring those questions up. And this next question is, what is the machine learning in MIMO channel? Any work is going on currently? Does that question make any sense? Yeah, the, I mean, the, it, yeah. so if the, if the question is uh, how machine learning is applied to massive MIMO or MIMO technologies, the answer is of course, because machine learning is everywhere now. And, 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 since mass, and since the MIMO technology is a key technology of wireless communication systems, there is a lot of, of work going on in the application of machine learning in MIMO communication technologies. So it can be used for, it can be, it, 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 it's used for many different reasons, many different um, goals. But my, my, my personal view is that if you want to use mass, machine learning in, in any, in any communication system, you should use machine learning whenever you cannot, you cannot properly model or tackle the problem by using classical, I mean, uh, techniques and algorithms. Because machine learning is like a black box. You, you let the, the machine learning algorithm wor I mean, work and then you get a solution and then, and then, and that's it. So the, my, my point is that you should, you shouldn't apply machine learning, just apply machine learning, apply machine learning whenever there is a lack in terms of theoretical tools that can be used to get a better understanding of the system. My work goes in the opposite direction. Instead of moving up, we are moving down at the electromagnetic level, at the, at the basics of the propagation conditions, because this is where we can gain a lot. Thank you so much for that answer. And we've just got enough time for one final question. And this one is, here we go. 
Research activities in the beyond massive MIMO context are carried out for passive or active surfaces, known as reconfigurable intelligent surfaces or uh, RISs, and large intelligent surfaces or LISs. What is your view on the two different technologies? Okay, my general view is that. Okay, that, that's true. There is a lot of research in, in, in using uh, large, large surfaces in a passive or active, uh, passive or active large intelligence surfaces. And my personal view is that since I'm coming from the MIMO, MIMO, MIMO world and especially massive MIMO world, I, I think uh, it, the, the, the future is digital, is not analog. So if you operate, if you want to, um, design a wireless communication system which is based on passive uh, surfaces i think there is a there is a lot more to gain if we introduce some uh, some active antennas in the in the system such that maybe passive and active at the same time but by, by introducing something active which means in the digital domain we can actually uh, we can actually improve the performance. This is the way to improve the performance of the system. If you rely only on a passive uh, surface, maybe the gains will not be very much relevant compared to what we can gain, what we can achieve today with a fully digital communication system. So my personal view is that we should go for digital, at, at least in part, lar in large intelligence surfaces and not only passive or analog. Uh, large intelligence surfaces. Thank you so much, uh, Associate Professor Sanguinetti, for joining us from Italy with that insightful presentation on holographic MIMO communication, which we all enjoyed. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.